Antony and Cleopatra took me back to biography. And in this case, a paired biography, you're looking at the lives of two individuals, Mark Antony, the Roman, and Cleopatra, the Ptolemaic queen of a kingdom that grew out of the, the great empire of Alexander the Great when it fell to pieces. And its heartland and its great strength was always Egypt, though at various times the Ptolemies did control more. And it's almost by default that they end up considering, considering themselves Egyptian rulers and an Egyptian dynasty because eventually there's not much else left. Now Cleopatra is of course the famous one. We hear about them, the, the names are obviously linked together through the Shakespeare play that is one of the most frequently performed of Shakespeare's works. So it's something that many people would have studied in school, will have seen, they'll be familiar with the Elizabeth Taylor epic, Cleopatra, various other Hollywood versions of it, stage versions of it. You know, there's been controversy recently over a, a drama documentary over the casting of the actress for Cleopatra, and that tends to crop up. Cleopatra becomes a symbol of other things that aren't necessarily associated with the politics of the first century BC. But she's interesting, and Cleopatra tends to loom much larger than everyone around her. But there is a problem with this. When people have written before, and they tend on the whole to write about Cleopatra because she is more exciting. There are not many women rulers from the ancient world that we know about in that level of detail, and that play such a prominent, visible part in a major period of the history of Greece or Rome. You know, there are Roman empresses who are important, but they tend to do their job behind the scenes. Augustus's wife, Livia, for instance. We don't know that much, really, about her. And many, and certainly her political influence, is very hard to trace specifically. And you've got a lot of rumour and innuendo because the Greeks and the Romans were never too keen when they came to write history on powerful women. And in the main, not exclusively, but in the main, they tend to depict them in a negative way. Cleopatra occupies this strange state where a lot of the sources are very hostile, but there's also admiration, there's wonder at her. It's quite interesting that Plutarch wrote a biography not of Cleopatra, but of Mark Antony. But it's in that life of Mark Antony where Cleopatra arrives and she almost hijacks the story. She is more interesting, and even Plutarch, a Greek writing in the early 2nd century AD, devotes a lot of time and space to her and has family memories from a grandfather who'd been at the court at the time and had some knowledge of how Antony and Cleopatra feasted. Now, modern biographers of Cleopatra always complain that we only really hear about her when she's involved with one of her Roman lovers, Julius Caesar or then Mark Antony. And they say, isn't this terrible? And this is a sign of the bias of our sources. And they're partly right, but only partly. There is another reason for this. Cleopatra moves onto the world stage when she has a connection with a powerful Roman, and her two lovers are Caesar, who'd fought his way and become dictator of Rome during the First Civil War from 49 to uh, 45 BC, and then Mark Antony, who is trying to succeed to Caesar's power, Caesar's status, and is an aristocrat from a very old, distinguished family himself. He is one of the most powerful men in the Roman world at that time. So she's connected with Roman power, and Rome is the great power. One of the underlying themes throughout this book is to emphasize that Ptolemaic Egypt is not a free, independent, great power in its own right. It hasn't been for a very long time, and it hasn't been because the Ptolemies have fought the other Hellenistic kingdoms and weakened themselves that way, but even more, they've plotted and murdered and killed each other to, for power within their own kingdom, and they've allowed the kingdom to decay, they've allowed a lot of money and strength to be wasted, and there is always a fundamental problem that you are a foreign dynasty imposed on a population that has a much, much older tradition that is still very, very strong linguistically, religiously, culturally, in every respect. There are two distinct systems of law within Ptolemaic Egypt, one for the Greek population and one for the Egyptian population. Alexandria, the great city of the Ptolemies, founded by Alexander the Great, but really developed under the Ptolemies into the second Athens. It was meant to be the center of learning, the place where so many philosophers of the Greek tradition would work, would study, where the great library was housed for so many centuries. This is a Greek city. 
And ancient sources, particularly the Romans, tend to refer to it not as Alexandria in Egypt, but Alexandria near Egypt. It's distinct, it's different, it's got a substantial Jewish population, as well as the Greeks, as well as the Egyptians, as well as the other people coming through. So Cleopatra is the ruler of an allied kingdom of the Roman Republic. And her own father had been chased out by a, a conspiracy that used her older sister as a figurehead and made her queen. He gets restored by Roman military might. That's the basic truth of first century BC, the Mediterranean world and the Ptolemaic kingdom in particular. The Romans are the big power. They have military might, they have economic strength. You can't really do anything if you oppose the Romans. And the other central theme, which tends to get lost in the propaganda of the civil war between the young Caesar, Octavian, if you prefer, man who become Augustus, and Mark Antony, where she's depicted as an enemy of Rome, a threat to Rome, is that she wasn't. Cleopatra, like all the Ptolemies, was a loyal ally of the Romans throughout her life. The problem she had, as so many other allied and client rulers faced, was that power at Rome kept changing hands very quickly, very abruptly, very violently and you never quite knew who was going to be in charge. So this is the story of Caesar again. We've already treated in, in greater depth in his biography, and Mark Antony and Octavian and Lepidus and Brutus and Cassius and all these others. They appear at different times. To be maintained as ruler of any substantial kingdom allied to the Romans, you need the backing of Rome. And that means you need to keep very much a weather eye on what's happening in Rome and support the greater power. Cleopatra's brother thought that he was winning Caesar's um, gratitude by killing Pompey and presenting Caesar with Pompey's head. Didn't work that way. Whether it was a convenient excuse or not, who knows. But Cleopatra then makes Caesar a better offer, arrives. Cleopatra has a lot more to offer to Caesar, both physically but probably also mentally. And the striking thing about Cleopatra is her intelligence, which comes through in all the sources, even the hostile ones, present her as very clever. She's supposed to have been a great linguist. She's supposed to have been the first of the Ptolemies to learn the Egyptian language. That's only down to one mention, one passage in Plutarch. So although it makes a lot of sense, we don't actually know. We have no further confirmation of that. No source claims she actually spoke Latin. I'm sure she could have learned the language had she wanted to, but she didn't need to in one sense because all aristocratic Romans were fluently bilingual in Greek as well as Latin. And the Romans have such a chip on their shoulder about Greek culture because they know that the Greeks have come out with so many ideas, so many thoughts, so many things they've done, not only before everyone else, but better than everyone else. And although the Romans have conquered the Greeks and have come to dominate the Greek world, they, they're in love with Greek culture. So this is an extra allure for Cleopatra and everything she can offer. But this is a complicated story, but it is very striking. We know most about Cleopatra during the years she's with Caesar and then the years with Mark Antony. And even then, there are big gaps. We know about Caesar's time in Alexandria and then Egypt in some detail partly through his own account, though that then stops fairly abruptly, and then the Alexandrian War that's continued by one of his officers and written later after Caesar's death. And we get mentions from elsewhere, and from Plutarch's Life of Caesar, in this case, from Suetonius' Life of Caesar. We don't know with 100% certainty whether or not Caesar was the father of Cleopatra's child, who gets the nickname Caesarion, or Little Caesar, but there's a good chance that he was. So you have to explore all of these things. You have to look at how it's presented. There has been a tendency in the past to assume that Cleopatra from about 46 BC goes to Rome and stays there for best part of two years, only leaving in a month or so after Caesar's assassination. There's actually no evidence for that. She's there in the last few months, but for how long, we don't really know. And it's quite striking that the orator Cicero who left all these speeches, but particularly these collections of letters, barely mentions Cleopatra. She's there just a few times and all the mentions are brief. One time he complains about visiting her in Rome and not being receiving the, the gift of books that he felt she promised him. And he talks about a rumor that she's 
drowned returning to her kingdom and her little Caesar with her, presumably a reference to Caesarion, which would be the only one from his lifetime that survives, uh, from Caesar's lifetime rather, rather than Caesarion's. So it could be that um, it's, you know, it's fair as people to say, well, Cicero had all sorts of hang-ups about women, particularly powerful women, and therefore he doesn't really like Cleopatra, he's hostile to her. However, far more significant is the fact that politically, he doesn't th consider her important. You know, if she was an important factor in the politics of those years, she would get a mention and she does not. This is something people find hard to accept because they want Cleopatra to be a big player. Um, time and time again in popular presentations of her, she's supposed to be the active partner. She's the one who is trying to rewrite the political map of the Mediterranean world with a reasonable chance of success. She wants to create this new combined Ptolemaic Roman Empire with Caesar, with Mark Antony, with whoever, to restore Egypt to its great strength, to protect Egypt from Roman imperialism, to protect the Egyptians from the aggression and exploitation of Rome. The problem is that when you look at the politics, when you look at the military realities of the period, none of this hangs together. And even the the well-meaning idea that, oh, well, she's trying to look after the Egyptians, she's trying to protect them from Roman exploitation, falls down because what she did very effectively throughout her life was to exploit the Egyptians and the Egyptian economy for the benefit of her Roman patrons. To stay in power, which for Ptolemy meant staying alive, you have to have Roman support, and the Romans want things for that. They want money, they want wheat, they want other types of grain, they want resources that Egypt can offer to supply their armies, to keep their war effort going. This is as true of Caesar as it is of Mark Antony. Now, again, notice even in this short video, Cleopatra's rather hijacked things because she's exciting. We want to know more about her. She's got that glamour, that star quality that means she does just take over. And again, you have to remember, she's only 21-ish when she meets Caesar. She's quite a young woman, and she's only in her late 30s when she takes her own life. So it's, it's a great dramatic story. She's a remarkable individual. She wasn't very nice because you couldn't be very nice and be a Ptolemy and stay alive for five minutes. This is a family where no one trusts anyone else. But Mark Antony gets forgotten, and one of the points of the book was trying to trace his life because... He was very much a conscious image builder throughout his political career. This is a man who presented himself as a great soldier, a great commander, a second Hercules, a second Dionysus the victor, all of these things. And Plutarch presents him that way. He contrasts him with the less mimicry, the less brave, but far shrewder Octavian Augustus, his ally, friend, brother-in-law, then opponent and the man who will defeat him. And of course, that's taken even further in most modern presentations. You know, Octavian becomes this really cold fish, cruel, uh, uncharismatic, always calculating, almost anemic in his presentation, in his physical appearance in a lot of movies like the, the old Cleopatra. The contrast is to Mark Antony, the bluff, simple soldier. It's there in Plutarch, it's developed in Shakespeare, it's grown even stronger over the centuries. But again, it's not quite true. When you look at Mark Antony's career, he actually spends rather less time with Roman armies than was common for a Roman politician. He doesn't seem to have seen that much service um, during his, his early career. He goes off, he is with the army that restores Cleopatra's father to Egypt. He does some fighting in Judea around about the same time. He will go to Caesar in Gaul, but he actually spends a lot of that time back in Rome canvassing for election to the Tribunate and elections are delayed. We know he's not there for quite a lot of time. He isn't someone who is there at Caesar's side all the way through those arduous campaigns in Gaul. He's there at some key episodes, but really it's very much at the end of that story. During the Civil War, Caesar mostly gives Mark Antony political responsibility. That's perhaps a reflection more of Antony's family name and reputation and the lack of distinguished followers that Caesar's managed to recruit than it is of his actual ability as a politician. You know, he doesn't make a terribly good job of this. Though, if you were cynical, you might say, well, maybe Caesar wants people to think that Mark Antony's terrible, but at least things will be better when good old charming Julius Caesar arrives back. Maybe, but I think that's probably taking paranoia to a, a, a level too far.
So you have a Mark Antony who doesn't actually fight many wars. In the first civil war, he fights after Caesar's death. He does quite well at the start, but he then gets defeated by a coalition of different armies that ends up being led by the man who becomes Caesar Augustus, the, the boy in his late teens with no military experience whatsoever. Antony loses. The heroic depictions of him sharing food with his men, marching at the head of the column, doing all of this, is about the retreat after he's lost the, the key battles. He does do well defeating Brutus and Cassius, and he's awarded the main credit for the victories at Philippi. But again, this is a civil war against equally amateur, ill-prepared, clumsy armies led by pretty inexperienced commanders. Cassius had served with Crassus in the Parthian campaign. He defended Syria afterwards and he'd took, taken part in the civil war where he'd been on the losing side against Caesar. Brutus has even less military experience. So these are not great Roman commanders at the head of experienced, sophisticated, well-drilled, um, co coherent Roman armies. This is very much a clash of amateurs. So he does well there, but again, this is not on the same sort of level as Pompey's victories or Caesar's victories or Lucullus's victories. He isn't one of the great captains of this era when there were quite a lot of very distinguished Roman generals. Later on, when he launches his big campaign against into Armenia and against the, the Parthians and into Medea, it's a shambles. He makes a mess of it. He does, he makes some key decisions and makes bad choices that end up meaning that his army is not going to achieve very much. He suffers huge losses. And the fact that his army isn't annihilated doesn't mean that this was a good operation. This is a failure. This is a serious defeat. And in the end, most of it goes down to Antony's poor preparation and not really understanding what he's doing. He's never commanded an army this big. He's never operated on this scale. And it shows. And in the Civil War, his leadership against not so much perhaps Octavian himself, but his key commander, Agrippa, is lacklustre at every stage. Antony doesn't seem to know what he's doing. He doesn't seem to have a plan to win the war. He's gathered large forces, he's gathered this large fleet, but he doesn't know, there isn't a plan. He's trying to do what Pompey had done and Brutus and Cassius had done, wait in Greece and then eventually go to Italy or wait for the enemy to come to you in Greece and defeat them there. It hasn't worked when it's been tried twice before, it doesn't work for Mark Antony. So you do have to wonder about the soundness of the strategy altogether. But even allowing for that, he doesn't make a very good job of leading and fighting this war. So Antony the Great Soldier is largely a product of Antony's own imagination, of his self-projection. It's what he wanted to be. It's like somebody dressing up as Napoleon and expecting to inherit all of his talent, all of his ability and all of his luck at the same time. Antony is a, a, a rather more average commander with limited experience who gets out of his league and doesn't know what to do. So the story is different all around. Antony is far more a politician than he is a soldier, and that's not the story that we expect. It's not the one we want to tell. So there's a lot in this book when you look in detail at both Antony and Cleopatra. They're not quite what we expect, but in many ways the truth is far more interesting. It doesn't mean that you can't go on with the literary versions, with the stage versions, but the history is there. The history is rather different. You shouldn't try and make the history and force it to fit your preconceptions. It's all about looking at the evidence, looking at what, as far as we can tell, actually happened. And that Antony and that Cleopatra are very different people to the ones of our imagination.